The Technique Series is brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching. Did you know that you can get a 100% free form check from one of our expert strength coaches? Seriously, absolutely 100% free. No credit card needed, no questions asked. Just go to barbelllogic.com slash technique and sign up for the free Barbell Logic experience now. Do that right now and then enjoy the show. Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hamburg. We've got Matt, and today we're going to do another one of our Q shows. We're going to do uh, cues for big pushing, for big pressing. Yeah, big press cues. Yeah. You know, I think we should, um, I was thinking about how to organize this show, and I think we should organize it f- since we're using big press cues, cues that matter the Let's most Let's do our show prep right now. Let's go. Oh, that's how we do this. Right. right? We just shoot from the hip. <laughs> So let, let's talk about cues from the most novice to the most advanced. Let's start with the things that work for everybody that we start. You know, somebody, somebody comes in from an mm. out-of-town session and hires you. Like, what are the main cues you're giving them on the press versus that? And then we can just sort of go down the list. Of, okay, and then we tend to see this, and we'll often add this cue, and we'll just – does that make sense? Kind of. Yep. So rather than it just being a hodgepodge of cues, let's go from, you know, wide part of the funnel and, and work ourselves down. So – the first thing I tell everybody when I start teaching them how to press is actually the press cues that occur before the press starts, which is close grip, elbows forward, wrist straight. Right. For everybody. Close grip, right? So for guys, it's, the grip's going to be usually where the neural starts. Your index finger's going to be where the neural starts. You might actually be a finger width more narrow. If you're a big wide guy, you might be a finger width wider. But even I put my grip exactly where the neural starts on the barbell. Yeah. When you when you press the bar out to lock out, your thumb will be right over your shoulder joint. That's, exactly That's pretty right. narrow. And that means that little that means that thin thin ladies and teenagers often will have two fingers or sometimes more on the smooth part of the bar on a press. Yep. What we're looking for there is a is a vertical forearm from the front. If I'm looking at them from the front, the forearm needs to be vertical. Yep. And when they lock out, their arm's just going to be straight vertical. up and down. Yeah, they're also going to be vertical. That's right. Yep. And elbows, f- elbows ahead. forward is the you know the, the people often take a grip that's a little bit too wide. It doesn't seem like it should be that wide. Um, so they the too wide. But for me, it's the elbows in front of the bar is that's the right. one that I end up hammering on the most uh, for the new person. It's often the one that the new person has never done. Like it feels the least natural of these. Mm-hmm. You know, usually you can cue wrist straight pretty quick. Often people will bend the wrist. And you say, look, wrist, and by the way, I know it's not wrist exactly straight, right? But it's the bar is sitting on the radius. The bar has got to be over the forearm. And then the part of that elbows being forward, there's two things that occur there. First, from a safety perspective, when I abduct my elbows, right, and I internally rotate and abduct my elbows, I can impinge the soft tissue up at the acromion. So the more my elbows flare out to the sides, Mm. the better chance there is that I'm impinging soft tissue. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have problems with the rotator cuff. So one of the, one of the cues of having that, the elbows forward is that it helps clear the soft tissue of the rotator cuff from getting pinched between the head of the humerus, the top of the humerus, and the, and the shoulder joint itself. Right? So that's, there's yep. a safety part there. There's a reason we do elbows forward. But the other reason we do elbows forward is this. The angle of the forearm tells you where the bar goes. The bar is going to go the direction that the forearm is pointing. So if the forearm is pointing, if the bar is starting on a press in front of my body, you know, like by my throat or down Mm -hmm. by my shoulders or just under my chin or, you know, depending on how long my forearm is, I need it to go right up my face and barely miss my nose and then kind of push back a little bit to stay over the middle of my foot. And if my elbows are behind my wrists and not in front of my wrists, the barbell is going to go forward. It's going to go up and forward, and I want it to go up and back. And that's actually, and if it's heavy enough, it won't go anywhere. You end up doing, if your elbow's behind the bar, you end up having to do a reverse curl. Curl to get it in, that's exactly right. If it's heavy enough, you can't even get it out of the rack with that. That's right. Uh, That's right. So So elbows elbows in front of the bar is a big one. And then the next one, I think, maybe the next one in 
order of difficulty or frequency, I guess, maybe. Tight knees, tight quads. Yeah. They'll, they'll be knee kicking it. They'll be yeah. using it. Everybody uh, wants to push press it mm -hmm. automatically. If they don't know better, they'll push press. Um, the, the other one that I'll use there before, before I even get them out of the, we, we kind of, you started to address this, but I, I always want people to take the bar out with authority on the press. More than any, more than any other lift, if you take the bar out of the rack soft, boy, there is a psychological thing that occurs and you're like, oh my God, this thing is so heavy, I can't press it. Mm. So that close grip, elbows forward, wrist straight must occur before the bar comes out of the rack and then hold as the bar comes out of the rack. If, you, if your elbows are behind, you started to mention this, if your elbows are behind the barbell, you can't even get it out of the rack if it's heavy mm. enough. And you'll sort of create a bad motor pattern there if you do that with the empty bar and light weight because it's just light enough to just reverse curl it out of the rack. But we can't do that when there's max effort weight on the bar when it's heavy. So you've got to dip down underneath the bar and you've got to make sure your elbows are forward before you take it out of the rack and your wrists are straight and your grip is closed. You take a big breath and boom, you stand up, step back, step back, and here we go. Now, we squeeze the quads tight, make the knees tight so that the legs don't contribute to the lift, right? And then we want to keep the bar close to our face. As we press the bar up, the bar has to stay close to our face. I'm aiming for the tip of my nose. Sometimes if somebody has bangs, actually somebody, like obviously I have no bangs, although I always run the bar through my beard. Always. I can feel it run through my whiskers. So if somebody has whiskers, sometimes I'll use that. If somebody has some bangs, I'll tell them to brush their bangs on the way up. To actually touch their hair. Like you, you don't have much hair. Like I mean, your hair's short. You're not bald. Here's, but it's still long enough that you ought to be able to actually run the barbell through your hair a little bit by your forehead. I have been moving that cue down. Like, oh, you say it later? No, like push it through your eyebrows, push it through your nose hair. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if they, is there something about telling them to push it through their bangs? They do it too late. I'm yeah, they'll like, still go around their face. They'll go around yeah. their nose and then start driving it back towards their hair. Yeah, you're I'll exactly probably right. end up telling people to like push it up their upper lip or something. <laughs> like I'm probably going to get it like if, if you know, somebody lower has and lower. a short. If a, obviously this only works for men with short beards or women with short beards too. I guess like occasionally, you know, I had a I had a great aunt once that could have done this. And she had <laughs> right. <laughs> what was her name? <laughs> she uh, she was a chain smoker. It sounded like uh, Marge Simpson's sisters. Right. So um, anyway, she. Uh, <laughs> If you, you can run it through your whiskers, it works really good. Now, you know, I've got my buddy Nate, who's got a 16-inch long beard. Mm. But uh, you can run it through your beard and still not have it anywhere near <laughs> your midfoot. So so we, a lot of times we'll use those. those we, we've we noticed, you and I have noticed, that we, we try to cue parts of the body more often than we cue the barbell itself. Yeah. Because people have a hard time with understanding where the barbell is um, you know, sometimes they've got really good kinesthetic awareness if they were an athlete or they were, uh, you know, did gymnastics a ton as a kid or whatever, then they can do that. But most people have a hard time really figuring out where the barbell is, but they know where their nose is. They know where their beard is, where their hairline is, where their chest is, you know, things like that. So, yeah, so I have a really hard that, time placing the, I have a really hard time putting the bar. Like if I'm thinking about what the bar, where the bar is, yeah. I'm, I'm in trouble yeah. typically. Yeah, so for years I have used, and I'll still use it, I don't want to act like I don't, but I'll often say, you know, throw the bar back. Throw the bar up and back. Make mm -hmm. the bar go up and back at an angle. Try to put the bar behind you. And of course, that, that doesn't work if somebody's got incredibly mobile shoulders. They'll actually put the bar behind their midfoot. But I can tell you all day to put, your, put the bar behind you. I can tell Father John Floater. I can tell myself, Brett McKay. I've never seen any of us ever put the bar a half inch behind midfoot. Because we no. can't, because our shoulders are too, too sticky. But I have started to change that cue of throwing it back to lead with the elbows. Because Press that your is elbows a, to the ceiling. That's right. Lead with the elbows. Make the elbows drive up first. So it's like yeah. hip drive. It's elbow drive for the press. And, and that keeps the elbows in front of the wrist and keeps that forearm angle where I need it to be so that the bar drives up and back. Um, and I tend to like that better, or I'll say, keep the elbows close together for as long as possible. I want the elbows to flare to the sides late. I don't yep. want them to flare early. So the elbows stay forward, drive the elbows up, drive the elbows up. And they'll naturally, you're going to naturally internally rotate as you get to the top of the, to the top of the movement. But I, I really don't want that internal rotation to occur until the bar is well above the head. Right. And then they should shrug. 
Shrug at the end. Yeah, and then absolutely. The, then, then the cue shrug. And then on the way down, I tell them, bend the bar in your hands. Because yeah, I want them to, to control the eccentric. Yeah, that's and right. I want that internal yep, rotation. That's right. That's and right. then I want the elbows back in front. And so if they think of bending that thing into a hoop above their head as it comes down, right. they'll put their elbow in the right spot. It causes them to pull their chest up. It causes them to use their lats to pull their shoulders back. And it puts them exactly where they need to be to do their second rep. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's bend, good. Bend, your bar, bend the bar in your hands. Bench press too. Yeah, same thing. Well, we were bar. talking about this on some previous episodes. That eccentric portion, controlling that is really, really important. Yep. Because on a press, staying tight, it's pretty easy to teach somebody how to get tight before rep one. But it's a lot harder to teach them how to stay tight between rep one and rep two. Yep. And that, you know, bending the bar in half and lowering the bar under control is something that we, we really want to do. Another press cue that I use a lot during the press is to get your shoulders under the bar as quick as possible. And so, mm -hmm. especially as somebody becomes a little more advanced and they start to sort of naturally have a little bit of a layback, the layback often will throw the shoulders backwards, not just down, but they'll go back. And so it creates this big moment arm between the shoulder joint and the barbell itself. Right. And that's okay because they're sort of playing the physics game of getting the elbows to extend without the bar having to go up, right? You can get the elbows to extend by making the shoulders go down and back. Yep. But you have to be able to control that moment arm. And so as soon as the elbows get ready to lock out or as they start to lock out, I've got to move the shoulders back underneath the bar as quickly as I can. So it's a combination of making the barbell go backwards, not throwing the bar forwards away from midfoot, but keeping the bar over midfoot. And we know at some point the shoulders drive behind midfoot, the faster that I can get my shoulders back to the midfoot spot while keeping the bar in place, the faster that thing will lock out. Here's the problem that you'll see sometimes. Sometimes as the shoulders move forward, it'll push the bar forward. Yep. The bar will go forward when the shoulders go forward. You have to shrug pretty carefully at the same time to keep that from happening. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, and, you know, you were talking about in order of, I don't know, difficulty from, you know, novice to more advanced, this sort of get under the bar, get your shoulders forward thing. That's something that happens. That's a problem later, typically, actually, definitely. I think. It's definitely later. So I'll tell them, get your shoulders forward. Another one I'll say is get your ass back. At the top? When at? Yeah. When you shrug, if they could get their butt back. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you're actually wanting them to get their shoulders forward, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes... Yeah, like, you don't want to... The people will end the press. I, you know, I won't mention anybody specifically, but definitely me. Scott Hamburg does this all the time. Yeah. The top of your press just looks like the top of an incline bench press. Yeah. That floater does this, too. And I'm like, dude, stand there for a second. Stand up tall. Shrug back and stick your ass out. Yeah. So that you're actually in a straight line because you'll end up looking at yourself and your torso is angled back at 60 degree angle and your arms are angled forward at a 60 degree angle. And so the bar stays over your midfoot, but like the rest of your body is not in line. Yeah, I, I can't snatch. I can't yeah. get my thumb behind my midline. Yeah, right. And um, thank so, you, you, kyphosis. Know, yeah. O o older guys with shoulder pathology, guys with the kyphosis, the hump on their back, they have a really hard time getting their head forward, their shoulders forward, their rump back and the, their hands back over the midline. I can definitely do a better job of it when I'm thinking of it and if I'm being unconscious of it. But man, you know, me just standing up and having a nice vertical line from bar to toe with my shoulder and my hip on that line is... Ugh. Yeah, but but and if I think coach, of getting my butt back, that helps me. Yeah, that's good. As a coach, I, I I want guys like you and and Floater and Brett and guys like that to to spend an extra second or two at the top of each rep to really get a good shrug and stretch that out, and especially on the last rep of every set. Mm. If we're doing sets of five, that fifth rep, man, I want you to hold it for three seconds, four seconds, and just shrug. The work's done. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. I know, I know you won't do it. I yell at you all the time. <laughs> Hanging before I press helps. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah, and so what do you think is tight there? Let's talk about that for a second. Dude, my spine is pointing forward. That, that's true. That's true. So you may be different. You, it, your, yours is actually, you've got a major kyphosis. Yeah, my thoracic I, I have spine another, is pointed forward. Yeah. So I have the same problem with getting the bar back over the midline, but I don't have the kyphosis. So the question is, what is in the way for me? Do you have any theories? Um, I don't know. Is it 
is it all the scar tissue from all your torn pecs? <laughs> no, it could be. I mean, certainly, it really, could have something to do with tight, it. tightness. No, no, yeah, in your for chest. sure. I've actually thought through this a lot. I think it's my lats. I think my lats are too tight. They grab that humerus. They just will not let the humerus go straight up. When I figured this out, because your your lats extend the humerus. I yep. hate that this is extension, but I do is. too. I hate so that. I want it to be flexion, but it's you know so. If you're going to take your do. palm, for our listeners who can't see, take your palm, yep. and you put your thumb, touch your thigh with your thumb, and then push your palm back behind you, Right, that's extension of the humerus. That's right. Now, if you just raise your hand like you need to get attention in class, yep. and try to take your hand and go behind your midline, yeah. that's flexion. That's flexion. That's, but that's it feels a, like that's it should be extension, right. but yeah, whatever. That's it. So, the, so the, the action of the lats are the thing that I think keeps me from fully finishing, I won't say extending, fully finishing the press and shrugging up. I can shrug, I can get actually a pretty good shrug, but I never, there's always some hold. And remember, I've torn my right lat. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and that's, and it was the problem. I can feel the pull back there. That's, if I'm thinking to myself, like, what is the thing that's inhibiting the lockout of the press for me. It's a really, really tight lat. So that's why I think Could things be. like hanging from a pull-up bar uh, or doing chins, uh, or if you actually have a nice uh, lat pull-down um, machine, high cable machine, and you can, you can do like an underhanded lat pull-down bar, you can get a nice big stretch at the top. To me, that's the best part about a lat pull-down machine yep. is when they're tall enough, you can really get a good stretch in there. And then you, get to, you get, still get to do the good lat work, but you really can kind of get that... I just, man, I think that I've had a hard time for years. I think all my years of competitive powerlifting before I was a strongman, when I converted over to strongman, strongmen don't bench, they press right. competitively. And I had a really hard time locking out presses after having never pressed for 10 years. Um, and also never doing chin ups, you know, like all the heavy back work I did as a powerlifter were like rows. So I never got an actual, you know, my, my arm would come straight out, um, at that angle perpendicular to my torso rather than mm -hmm. with my parallel to my torso. And so that, that created some problems. So yeah, th those are all really important. I, I've got another. So as we walk down through the advancement level, so we've got well, the, I, I think we're ahead a little bit. Yeah. So I'm, I was going to back up. I was going to back yeah. up. I was going to, so I was going to so tight, let, tight let's, quad, let's, tight abs. Yeah. So in the beginning, we've got the cues of the close grip elbows, forward wrist straight before you take it out of the, out of the rack. We've got take it out of the rack with authority. And then as you walk back, that's right. Tight knees or quads, tight core, tight abs, right? Yeah. Not, not sucked in, a good solid Valsalva. Uh, we've, I think we've talked about this before. I think a belt helps the press more than it helps any other lift. I like a thicker belt here. I like a four-inch belt mm -hmm. because I don't, want any, I don't want any loss. I don't want any energy loss in my torso. And my torso is not doing anything but transmitting force. I like a four inch belt because a 12 inch belt is illegal. That's right. If there was a 12 inch belt would be, if that was legal, I would use that on a press. Yeah. And, That's exactly and right. even, even if you have trouble with a three, you know, you need a three inch belt with the squat and the deadlift, you're not bending over. You don't need it. You just want to put yourself Correct. in a sleeve here, a torso sleeve. So get your That's four right. inch belt for cast, your big presses. Cast the torso, brush the nose, lead with the elbows, throw it back. The lead with the elbows, throw it back are the same cue, right? What else do you have before we go advanced? Well, you got to have the tight quads. You got to have the tight abs against that belt to get the bounce from the hip throw in the hip in the press 2.0. Okay. And so if, yeah. if you're not getting that bounce, the chances are is one, abs and quads aren't tight enough. Or two, um, the, the, the hip throw, I'm making the air quotes thing here. The yeah. Hip, the throw isn't sharp enough. Yeah. If they're not getting the bounce, those are the things I've, Typically, I'm looking to see, and there's not, there are other things that can cause that, but those are the main ones, I think. Yeah, so I see that a lot with, um, I, I tend to see that more with females than I do guys. They get um, wiggly in their pelvis and abs when mm. they're trying to push their hips forward. Mm. So you just, rather than, by the way, and I, I think this hip throw is, is, it will work for novices who are, who have some kinesthetic awareness, but for people who really struggle with kinesthetic awareness, I'll just, I'll just have them strict what we call yeah. military press first. And once they kind of get that motor pattern down, I'll start to add that hip movement a little bit so that when the hips push forward, 
what are you thinking about? I get this question all the time. You think about like squeezing the glutes. You're like, no, I don't think about, I don't think anything about the glutes. I think push the hips forward. I, I perform a tight Valsalva. I tense up against the belt and I literally just push my hips. I squeeze my quads. I think about my quads mm-hmm. a lot and I just push my hips forward. Well, do you want to push or throw? I, I tell them to throw the belt buckle. Yeah, that's fine because you're, and that's the way that it's really taught. I have, man, the more and more I do this, I default to a slower hip. I, I do too. I don't, I don't like a throw as much as I like a push because I think it's for the same reason that we control the eccentric portion of the, of mm-hmm. the movement. So, you know, a press doesn't start with an eccentric. It starts with a, it's a, it's like a deadlift. It starts from a dead stop at the first rep. And so I, I liked my version of the eccentric being able to control the thing that happens right before the concentric. I really like a slower push. I've, I've moved more towards a slow push. I think they can control the bar path better yeah. than with throwing the thing. Now, if they can throw it forward and control the bar path, that's probably better because the rebound is better. But my experience has been that the control of the bar ends up working better with a slow push forward. So two things. One, if you're, if you're a, a lifter, and rather than just pushing everything forward, you're, you, another sometimes the pushing the hips forward throws somebody off, and I might tell them to push their belly button forward, push their mm. right, push your belly button forward because you can't wiggle your belly button, but you can wiggle your pelvis, you can wiggle your hips. So if somebody's wiggling, like they're actually they're rotating anterior, posterior, pelvic, like they're actually in the middle of the kind of like do a quick like pelvic wiggle, like forward back, right. I'm like, no, 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 that's not what it is. Like, make all that tight, squeeze your quads, and just shove your belly button forward. There's nothing to turn. And so I'll use that as a, as a cue a lot of times. And then here's the key. As the hips go forward, the bar goes down, not back. <laughs> it's the number one problem I see with this hip throw, whether it's a slow hip or a fast hip. But the hips go forward, the, sh- the bar goes back backwards. Well, that, the backwards movement of the bar doesn't lead to upward movement of the bar. Mm-hmm. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The backwards movement of the bar rebounds the bar forward, and it makes it go the wrong direction. I'll even when tell people. When the hips go forward, the shoulders have to go down. I'll tell people to pull the bar down. Me too. I actually wrote it down. Pull the bar down. So crazy. Keeping the elbows up. I say try to make it touch the shoulders, clavicle, chest, depending on what they're. That's so interesting. Keep the elbows up, pull the bar down. I haven't coached somebody in the same room with you or seen you coach somebody in the same room with me in 18 months. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. interesting. I say it all the time. I say, I say the pull the bar down. Right. Pull it down. Now, don't pull it down and drop your elbows. If you pull it down and drop your elbows, nothing got tighter. But if you think about compressing a spring as I compress right into the circle of tightness of the spring, mm-hmm. it builds up all this potential, uh, wham, and then it, and it opens up. I can do the same thing. So as I push my hips forward, I'm keeping my elbows up and I'm pulling the bar down. But if my elbows drop, everything's loose. I don't ever want to do on any of these movements, I don't want to go where it's comfortable. Right. I want to go where it's tight. Yeah, so Those I'm are two different things. Bending the bar, pulling the bar down and bending it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's next? I've got well, that's, one. That's the, big, that's the big deal for me going into intermediate. And then, and then from there, you can start to move into more advanced sort of stuff. I start people, I start people without the hip throw. I start without it strict press, strict, press, strict press, strict press. And then later on, I'll have them start you know, doing something with their hips, whether it's the slow movement or if I figure out that they're fairly explosive, they can actually get a real bounce. Uh, and then I'll have to start that. I start with certain people teaching them a double layback. Yeah. And which is tough, sure. really tough. Sure. Um, but I'll tell them, uh, the, the main thing that I do that seems to help is I tell them when it gets above your hairline, look at the bar. Okay. So it, it's a strict press. You throw your hips, yep. but it's a strict press until it gets over your head. And then I want you to look at it and then okay. that, that can often, that can often help help them figure out the timing in getting that second layback. I hope you're enjoying this episode in the technique series of the Barbell Logic podcast. You know, at Barbell Logic, we believe that barbell-based strength training is literally for everyone and that the only thing holding most people back from all the incredible benefits that come from it is good technique and consistency. And we can help with that too. 
And whether you're just getting started or you've been lifting for a while, it's difficult to know if you're performing the lifts correctly or if there's anything you can do to make your lifting better. We have tons of free resources online from basic how-to videos that'll get you lifting safely and efficiently right away to podcasts, articles, and videos that will help you troubleshoot common errors. All you have to do is visit barbelllogic.com slash technique to see our best technique-focused content in one place. And while you're at it, you can sign up for a consultation with a Barbell Logic coach. This is a free form check and a chance to ask an expert all your training-related questions. There's no reason you should be struggling to get started or to make progress. Check out barbelllogic.com slash technique for more information and sign up for the Barbell Logic experience. Again, it's 100% free. There's nothing better for your training than knowing you're lifting safely, training efficiently, and on the right track. All right, let's get back to the show. Yeah, the layback is interesting because it often creates cadence problems between the throw, Mm -hmm. the layback, and the lockout. It's really three different movements, Mm -hmm. right? It's the hip throw. And so one of the keys on if you're going to lay back is you, you set yourself up for success the higher you can throw the bar. Yep. It's like an a it's a it's a explosive movement. It's like a clean or a snatch. The higher you can pull the bar on a clean or a snatch, the easier it is to get under the bar. On a press, it's the same thing. The higher I can throw the bar before I have to start laying back, the more extended my elbows will be as I lay back. Which means that the goal is just to throw it as high as I can, lay back a little bit, elbows lock out, and then I just stand up with the thing. But what tends to happen is I throw the bar or or a client or lifter throws the bar. And they start to lay back early. They, they lay, lay back, back when the bar is at their eyeballs. Mm-hmm. And they lay back and the bar just totally stops moving or even goes down an inch or two until they can recontrol the bar. Lay back, lay back, lay back, lay back. Okay, here we go. Now the bar starts coming back up again. And it's a very inefficient. That we, we gain no efficiency on the lift. We just got fast at the layback. So it's, I would equate it if we keep it with the Olympic weightlifting process. It's like somebody bailing on the pull, the second pull, early to dive into the full the full clean to dive into the, the the rack where they're they're dropping into the bottom of a front squat but they never finish the pull mm-hmm. you have to finish the throw yeah before that's, you lay back that's why i'm telling them to look at the bar once it gets what, it's above over their your head, head over their yeah. head or above their hairline yeah. and it depends on how long their forearms are and sure I, and by the way the double layback you already laid back once that's so right they have to throw their hips to even get it that's exactly right. The reason you're throwing your hips a lot of times, there's a piece of this we haven't talked about. The simple part of it is like we know you're throwing your hips because it gets tight and you get some rebound and you get all these things, but it gets your face out of the way. Yeah. So it gets everything out of the way so the bar can actually be thrown in a straight line. Hmm. If we, you if you really press strictly, if you teach somebody a strict press with no hips, the bar has to go around their face a little bit. Yeah. It either has to start slightly in front of the midfoot and go back over the midfoot, or it starts over the midfoot, goes around the face, and then locks out over the midfoot. Well, that's a there's an inefficiency there. Which reminds me of a cue that we should have mentioned earlier. You've got to keep it close to your face on the way down. That's a that's big Oh, one. that's exactly right. Yeah, I forgot that. Same people bar often, path. Yeah, people c- might be able to press it out vertically yep. and over their foot, yeah. and then they'll bring it around their head on the way down, that's right. and then they're wrecked. When they, well, th- if you think bring about it squat. around... Your elbows will be behind the bar. If you bring it around your face, you're in trouble. You're going to be in the wrong position at the bottom. Yeah. You've got to get your elbows in front of it as early as you can on the way down and then get your head out of the way. That's right. You got to keep it close on the way down. Well, think about think about a squat. We we talk about the master cue being bar over the midfoot on the squat. We're not just talking about the concentric phase of the squat. What happens if you lower a squat with the barbell? If you descend in the squat with the barbell four inches in front of midfoot, mm. you're done. Fold in half, you don't get back up. A press is the same way. The reason we don't think about it that way is because the press starts with the concentric portion and ends with the eccentric. So we start with the concentric, we press in a straight line, then often people bring it down way out in front of their midfoot and they try to catch it and they're like, oh God, now I don't have any tightness. Well, even if you don't bail on the barbell, even if you don't lose the barbell forward, it's really hard to get back into a tight position to start the next rep. How often do you cue midfoot on press? I do quite a bit. On the push I do I just say keep it close on the way down I really say midfoot on the eccentric portion you, will you say it on both I say it on both my, my older guys with their beat up shoulders they've got to lower that bar fairly slowly just sure. so it not hammer their shoulder at the sure. bottom sure. and and since they're lowering it I mean you're talking about being at lockout 
and the lowering is going to be a one, two, three often. Like it's yeah. pretty slow for these sure. older guys. They have an opportunity to actually they don't have to think about where the bar is. They can think about midfoot just like a squat. Yeah. They don't have to think. They it's can, slow enough to matter. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Man, yep. throw in the hips, more about shoulder, throw in the hips and getting like the, the, the regular press 2.0 just hammers my shoulders, man. I can't do it very often. Hurts. Where does it hurt? Uh, right on top. And it's in the right bottom. Boom. Right, when it, yeah. right at the bottom. It's not, it's not when it starts to move. It's like yeah, right as I throw the hip, it's bam, it yeah. hurts. It's uh, you know, you're talking about teaching somebody how to how to lay back. I mean, I think the best example we have of that is your wife. Your wife is is one of the best pressers in the country. Uh, what she press day for yesterday? She pressed one forty seven and a half, just jacking around in the print in the gym. Yeah, and then what was her her work sets were ridiculous. Oh, it was like, like one, it was like one forty for one forty two or something, or one forty two, and she hit for reps like for like for like eight, I think. It was yeah, it was crazy. Was it that many? Um. Uh, no, I mean she did. I think she did a bunch of sets. Like she did like one forty two and a half for like five sets of three or something, right. or something dumb. Um, but she for a long time was just the strictest presser you ever saw. I mean, she just strict everything. Yeah, no hip throw to start, no layback to finish, and self righteous about it. Yeah, right. And just <laughs> wouldn't be like she's like, but I'm a better presser than everybody else because I'm strict. Right, right. It's like the it's like in the two thousand four when some of the people started lifting raw and powerlifting. Like, yeah, all the rest of you guys are using bench shirts and cheating. Right. She's like, I'm the only non cheater there is. And I said, Yeah, you can be a non cheater all you want, or we can be the biggest presser in the country. Which one do you want to be? And she was like, Okay. So we we taught her the hip throw, which still isn't. She doesn't do a lot of hip throw. No. But she does. She's perfected the layback. And it took her a while to learn it, but she she got it. And she's great. So yeah, she's you know she's a she's a one fifty presser at this point for a female, which is crazy. Yeah, and she's um, and she's looking at the bar. She is consciously looking at the bar to get that layback. Right. Now. That's right. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. And you don't look at it the whole darn time, but no, to set right. the back angle in the double in the second layback, you look at it to do that, and then you get your eye gaze back forward, and then it's stand up with it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, and then you'll see, you'll see like one of the things that Charity is so good at is she's she's been able to perfect that, get her shoulders back under the bar as quickly as possible. So she she has a big throw. She lays back until her elbows nearly lock or lock, and then very quickly she moves her shoulders forward and gets them back under the bar. And because she's doing that, she has to be actively pushing the barbell backwards. Or if she's not, the barbell will just keep going forward as her shoulders come forward. And she's figured out the cadence there, man. She can just... She throws the bar, she lays back, it gets right to lock out, and she immediately moves her shoulders underneath the bar while shoving the barbell back. So everything comes in line. We talk about that. Everything sort of gets a little bit away from the gravity vector, especially in the shoulders on the shoulder side. And then as it comes back in, boom, it comes into a nice tight vertical line. Everything directly over midfoot works really well. I just remembered. Yeah. So she did a heavy single, and then she had to do, she did like 147. And then I think you had her do like, five at 135 and then she did eight at 125 right 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 ridiculous really strong really strong so those are those are the big cues wear your wear your I, belts uh wear your wrist straps yep. and uh keep the bar in close that's yeah keep it in tight it's a dance move you know there's so many timing elements and there's so many elements of control uh it's a lot like the squat in that respect you know yeah it's just it's just about control uh, we talked about the momentum in the squat uh, a couple episodes ago, like controlling the downward momentum of the bar and how it can make people bend over too much. If you don't control the downward momentum in the press, your elbow will get behind the bar and then you will shove the bar away from your face in your second rep. So you got to control that thing, keep the elbows in front, uh, tight quads, and you'll probably be okay. And then you got to do a whole bunch of it. Uh, your press isn't going to get giant doing three sets of five and five sets of three forever. <laughs> You right. gotta just push that volume up, push it up, push it up, and uh, yeah, and it's, I, the press seems to respond really well from that combo of like heavy, heavy singles to get used to lifting heavy, and then the back offsets for the volume that you need to really like build the muscle and get the work in. You've got to keep pushing that work, so it's it's one of those ones that I think probably benefits first from that combination. We talk about you know the arguing between what comes first with the chicken or the egg is it volume intensity volume intensity whatever i think pretty quick the press is the first one that moves to both both yeah. you hit your intensity you hit your you hit your single or your several singles in a row or your top set of triple and then back offsets to get the work in there's just not enough muscle mass to like you know if you're an old guy with like 
just kaji shoulders, just, just jacked up shoulders, like you might not be able to do the volume, but if your shoulders are decently healthy, like I don't think you, Scott, can do six sets, of, six work sets of press. No, I don't think your shoulders can handle it. But I think for most people, if you got healthy shoulders, then you can you can get that work in after the heavy singles, and it doesn't seem to beat you up too bad. And I have to do the heavy singles; they're so shocking and so stressful. Yeah. But if I don't regularly do them, I can't do them because yeah. they're just too. They it's just, just too different. Just like, yeah. like getting hit in the face. They're so bad. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine's headed back up. I think I've got a a bench press and a press PR. Yeah, you're pressing well, 200 again. On the near horizon, the squat and the deadlift are a mystery to me right now, but that's fine. Um, it's a bench press and the press. Just keep Well, keep you say the squat and the deadlift, but like it's weird. You're just, your squat and deadlift are just inconsistent. You'll have like one of the best days of your life. And then three days later, four days later, you're like stapled to the floor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like what? How could it have been that easy three days ago? Stupid. So you know it's not a strength issue. It's it's it's, it's like between your ears or it's fatigue or something. But yeah, it's not it's not strength. So good. Did you did you enjoy my uh, videos the other day where I, I pressed and squatted in overalls? I I've just gotten used to that. Yeah. You, you and your wife both, you guys just train in like normal clothes at this point. And by right. normal clothes, I mean Oklahoma clothes. <laughs> right. By just normal clothes, I mean Dust Bowl, you know, 1923. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. That's press cues, guys. So that's all the ones I know. No. I'm sure I've yeah, used a few more. more, but I don't use a few more. Those are the main ones I use. Those are the big ones. Right. Like, I mean, look, you're you're pulling part of the deal is you pull out of a toolbox. And, and just like in any toolbox, you open up the top of that toolbox, right? You got your screwdrivers, you got your hammer, you got your socket set. And as you keep going down in, you get deeper and deeper and deeper. You start to get to these weird tools you only use like once a decade. Right. And it's the same thing here. Like, you, you know, what we gave you on this episode were the cues we use every day all the time with all their clients. There, there's some stuff I do that I didn't mention. Uh, I use all the time. I grab their elbows when they're locked out and show them how to shrug. Do that all sure. the time. Me too. Um, just not on online coaching. It's harder right. to do that. Uh, um, I'm telling people to get under the bar when they lock out. I'll put my hand on their on their their belt buckle and my other hand on their back and show yeah. them how I want them to. Not when, it's, yeah. not when it's super heavy. You don't want to do that. Yeah. If I, but if it's like the bar, you know, I, yeah. I'll put their hip and their shoulder where I want it to be. I like that. I'm gonna have I'm gonna have Charity or Todd do that to you next time you press. <laughs> my, Make you actually stand up tall. My shoulder will just go click and my arm will break <laughs> and we'll all die. <laughs> so I, I, I lay hands on them a lot. Um, yeah, of course. Put my we'll hand out there, oil. and I'm like, throw your hips out here, hit my hand, um, that that kind of stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I think we've I think we've covered it all. Uh, go to iTunes, give us that review, share this episode with your buddy who's press sucks, um, and and tell them that they need to be listening to Barbell Logic and uh, see if we can be a little help to them and to get that help them get those press numbers up. Anything else, Uncle Matt? Nope, that's good. All right, we'll talk to you guys soon.